if you want to go back to the beginning of the Western slave trade, I, the narrative is that the, the white Europeans came over there and stole us from our land. Mm-hmm. It's still anything. They bought it. Question becomes, who they buy from? And we are back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to yet another episode of the Identity Crisis podcast where we endeavor to give an answer for the hope that lies within us, yet doing so with gentleness and respect. I am your co-host, Jalen Thompson. Dylan Schweitzer. Dill, what's the word, bro? How you feeling today, man? I'm feeling pretty frisky. Frisky? Frisky. Energetic, yeah. ready to go. All right. Never. It's a new one. Yeah, it, yeah it's new. Yeah. Definitely. Never heard you say that one before. It right. kind of bothered me. It's okay. Um, You'll get over it. Yeah, I'll do, I will. We'll I have no other choice. <laughs> oh, man. So, what's on the docket today, man? What are we what are we cooking up? So we have a very simple, lighthearted, easygoing topic, not controversial, or a big talking point in America at all today. Let's do it. What is it? Nothing major. Promise. Just racism. <laughs> That's not an issue at all in America today, right? <laughs> no, no, no. We're not 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 a black guy and a white guy getting together to discuss. Uh, uh, racism in 2023. Yeah, you bigot. Yeah, you got some nerve. <laughs> you got some nerve. <laughs> oh my goodness, cancel us already. Uh, but yeah, man. So we're gonna talk about racism today, huh? I think so. Yeah, let's do it, man. Uh, we'll we'll discuss it at at large. Um, you know, we'll discuss uh, some things about the past. Sure. We'll discuss what's going on now, mm-hmm. and then let's see if we can tie this up in a a nice pretty bow and put a biblical perspective to this thing. I like it. Perhaps there isn't a biblical perspective. Sure. Maybe there isn't. Or maybe there is. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) So let's do some time traveling. Let's start here and then we can kind of go back to where we were in the past, at least as a country in America. So where are we today with racism? Is it a problem? Is it not? Um, well, I, what I was thinking, I was thinking, let's go back first. What do you, oh, okay. You want to go back first? Hey, I like to time travel. Yeah, let's let's go back to the past first, and let's let's kind of acknowledge sure what happened, and then let's talk about what's happening in light of what happened. I like it. It's a better idea. Cool beans. Let's do that. So, I guess when we when we do this, when we talk about this, we have to acknowledge um, that uh, the idea of racism, the ideology of racism. Um, is in fact a stain on America's past. Um, it happened. Mm-hmm. It was absolutely woven into our past in a variety of different ways. Um, you know, from the hypocrisy of uh, the hypocrisies of some of the founders of this country, mm-hmm. um, who uh, wrote some of the the most eloquent words of the. Uh, of the constitution, you know, we hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, uh, with certain unalienable rights endowed by their creator. Right. All at the same time, some of them had slaves. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so as there's a, a Daniel Tosh skate where he goes, all men are created equal. And he looks over his buddies. You know what we mean by that. Like, so that that's in there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That, that That's in there. Uh, you kind of you can kind of see that cognitive dissonance on display. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you got even beyond that, um, you got the um, the the Western slave trade mm-hmm. that took place when, and actually here in America is where uh, you first see um, kind of a race based slavery. Yeah, um, here here in America is where is where you first see that, um, and you know we got all the atrocities that. That were that were involved in that, um, everything from the obviously the physical subjugation of of the um, Africans who were brought over on boats to um, the um, the withholding of educational resources for them, not being able to read and write um, or not being taught to read and write um, here in America for the purposes of keeping them slaves. We have even the 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 misuse of the Bible, right, to promote mm-hmm. slavery. Um, where uh, the European uh, slave masters uh, bastardized uh, scripture, uh, removed entire books of the Bible um, to promote a message that would keep the African slaves 
slaves for the rest of their lives Mm -hmm. and had them thinking that in me being a slave to my um, European slave master, I'm doing God's will. Mm -hmm. And we obviously know that that wasn't the case. Um, But, you know, these are some of the things that are involved. Um, What do you think about those things thus far? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's uh, not a great start to a country. That's to for say sure. the least. Sure. And, and even in the progress that was made, and even, even in the bad things that took place, you can kind of see justice prevailing slowly but surely mm-hmm. in that. Um, when you look at things that took place like the Civil War, mm-hmm. uh, you know, which was uh, uh, an effort to amend what was what amend the wrongs that were taking place in the South. Um, and then you go from the civil war where, where the slaves were freed to, you got uh, holidays like Juneteenth where right. they were freed, but didn't know they were free. Right. right? right. Um, you have, um, um, the, the, the Jim Crow South, right. Uh, there were these laws were set up where, okay, sure. You guys aren't slaves anymore. You aren't free, but you don't have access to a certain quality of living or you're not able to access the quality of living that, uh, a white person in the South was able to have access to. Uh, you're going to go um, to schools that lack books or have the beaten, broken down books. You're gonna, mm-hmm. you're gonna, you're not gonna have the the auxiliary resources that um, white people were able to have in the South. You're not gonna be able to vote. You're not gonna uh, be able to. Um, oh, speaking of being able to vote, you got the three fifths compromise. Mm-hmm. Uh, even before that, before we go to the Jim Crow South. Um, but yeah, even Jim Crow stop, you're not going to be able to vote. You can't sit in the same restaurants as us. You know, you got to sit in the back of the bus. You got to, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you're unable to, to buy homes in certain communities and all of these different things that took place. Um, yeah, all of these things were, they happened. Mm-hmm. Um, they were certainly blemishes on our, on our nation's past. Mm-hmm. Um, and for, for whatever reason, um, uh, they're still felt to this day mm-hmm. um, by by certain people, uh, certain people. Uh, I, I I guess I can I guess I actually know the reason. It's because it wasn't that long ago. What I mean by it wasn't that long ago is our grandparents, you and I's grandparents, mm-hmm. grew up in some of these areas where yeah they may have uh, experienced racism, um or or, or seen it. You know, at their own, seeing other people in their family, other people that are around them doing it, mm-hmm. you know. And so you, when you think about it, you know, my 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 grandparents that right now are in their seventies. Mm-hmm. It's not a long time ago. Yeah. You know, I mean, your your grandparents would be what are they? Seventies, eighties. Yeah, yeah, early to mid seventies. Yeah. So so we're talking. You know, there's like a 45, we, we, we rewind the clock 45, 50, 60 years. Mm-hmm. This, we're, we're talking about the time that we're describing right now. We're right yeah. back in that. And so it's really not a long time ago because the the group of people who experienced this, some of this stuff, were they're still alive right now. Right. And, and telling their stories um, and things like that. And uh, so it makes for an interesting conversation. Absolutely. What are you thinking? I'm just kind of soaking in this this history lesson. Yeah. So I mean, I mean you got I mean you got more you got more than that, man. You got um you got stuff like uh you know obviously you got the segregated schools right that that took place in um in in this in the Jim Crow South. You had uh mm-hmm. things like redlining. You know what redlining is? Yeah, I think it's the the concept where they wouldn't allow certain people of color to be able to purchase certain properties and mm-hmm. stuff like that within certain within certain zones. Yeah, I was actually. Uh, her, hearing from this guy t- earlier today, where he actually witnessed an actual co- contract for a uh, for a deed to a house, where it said you could sell this house only to people of the Caucasian race. Like it wow, was straight up in the deed of the house. Yep. So like they were not going to sell it to someone of color. Yeah, and that's interesting. I so he he legit put it in his like so he he legit structured the contract in a certain in a certain way where even if it's in my possession or in your possession. In this You're violating example. the contract. Yeah, you couldn't sell it to me. And mm-hmm. it's a violation of the contract, even though the, the house is now yours. And if you think about it, like if I was selling a piece of property or trying to make a profit off of something from a business perspective, well, you could at least mark it up to someone if you were going to be racist. But sure. it takes, a, I think, a certain level of disdain to be like, no, I don't care how much profit I'm going to make. I'm just going to 
not sell it to someone specifically based on the color of their skin. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of it's a ridiculous concept. It's a ridiculous concept. Um, you know, then you got you got um, um, certain movements that spawn out of um, out of the mistreatment of of, uh, of black people back in that time. The civil rights movement. Um, you got, uh, you know, key key figures like uh, Rosa Parks, um, uh, Martin Luther King, obviously the popular ones, right? Malcolm X. Um, you got uh, people like Megger Evans. Uh, um, um, yeah, some of these names are slipping my mind now. But just key figures that rose up uh, at, at, at this particular time to fight against some of these, uh, some of these just uh, flat out wrong and evil um ideologies of racism that were going on at the time and taking a stand to say that hey this is wrong and we ought not be treated this way Mm -hmm. but something that i find interesting uh from a philosophical standpoint regarding uh those movements and regarding some of those figures that i brought that i brought up was that um whether they knew it or not um they were appealing to an authority outside of black people, white people, whomever for that matter, to say that the way that I'm being treated or the way that um, anybody's being treated uh, based on the color of their skin is absolutely wrong. Mm-hmm. And they and then they and they spoke with this um, with this conviction as though I'm not just giving you my personal opinion. Right. I'm, I'm not just telling you, you know, you know, hey, I, I, I feel like I ought to be able to buy a house in the neighborhood that I, you know, that I, that I choose so long as I can afford it. Right. Um, I ought to be able to go to whatever school I want to go to mm-hmm. or something like that. No, it seems like they were appealing to an, an authority beyond all of us that transcends all of us that says, no, I am I am your equal, not your inferior. Right. Right. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's um, it kind of loosely reminds me of like the Nuremberg trials. Sure. Where um, basically the, the the trial came to a halt because they're just like, yo, guys, we're just, you know, following our government. Hitler's telling us what to do. So mm-hmm. we're just trying to be good citizens. And the trial was halted for a couple of weeks. And eventually someone came back on, I believe, the American side who was basically saying, you're not subjugated to just simply the laws of your country, but you're subjugated to a higher moral standard that is beyond you in general Mm -hmm. and you have violated that universal standard essentially i'm kind of paraphrasing of course Mm -hmm. and that's what a lot of this these movements kind of remind me of and and when we think of the most pivotal figure in all of like the civil rights movement in the 20th century of america we're talking about i believe a baptist preacher right i don't he might have been baptist i'm not sure uh martin luther king yeah i believe he was yeah so we're, we're talking a, a pastor was one of the leading figures in this movement. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that's really interesting. Oh, sure. You know, especially when today we hear things like Christianity is the white man's religion. Christianity is a racist, homophobic religion. Christianity is um, has a white Jesus and not for black. There's just these ridiculous things that you hear. Mm-hmm. And yet when we think about the civil rights movement and people who made headway, not only in the civil rights, but just in in American history in general, it was usually Christians who were pushing against the narrative. Now, don't get me wrong. People who proclaimed the name of Christ apparently did distort and mishandle the Bible on purpose for the subjugation of other human beings. Mm -hmm. They took a holy text and mangled it to pieces to get what they wanted. And that was a terrible thing. Yeah. But there was people who actually were trying to follow Christ with their whole heart, mm-hmm. who noticed that this was wrong. Mm-hmm. And one of and the the big pivotal figure when we whenever we talk about the civil rights, usually Martin Luther King's the guy who's coming up. Sure. And so I I just find it interesting that that it was a a pastor mm-hmm. that was spearheading this big movement. Sure. And so I I think this sort of Christian perspective is what really started getting the ball rolling the other mm-hmm. direction. And showing the hypocrisy of people who are more like, uh, I go to church a few times a year, sort of thing. And sure. those are the Christians. Sure. You and, know. In, you know, in, in racism, you know, back in that time, even infiltrated the church and those who claim the name of Christ, right? Um, there were, uh, as a matter of fact, in speaking of Martin Luther King, his letter uh, from a Birmingham jail, mm-hmm. uh, one of the things that he actually kind of brought up in that letter to the white pastors uh, were, was, was, hey, guys, 
uh, if you claim to follow this Jesus of the Bible, you sure don't act like it. Right. You're not acting like that guy. Mm-hmm. And when, when you when you when you don't allow uh, black uh, church members into your congregation, you don't or oh, I'm sorry, church goers into your congregation uh, when you, when you don't allow them to uh, interact with the people and and socialize with the people. You don't when you don't feed them, when you treat them differently than you treat everybody else based on the color of their skin, mm-hmm. you're not acting like Jesus. Right. And, you know, he, and I, I find it interesting that once, like you just said, he was he was at the head of this movement, but that he also was using Jesus as the standard for mm-hmm. how we ought to conduct ourselves as, as it relates to this whole idea of race. Yeah, and it's funny because Frederick Douglass, you know, infamous uh, slave, also said very similar things in a lot of his letters. Like he yes. said, the, the Christianity that he saw in the slave masters was not the same Christianity that was in the personhood of Christ that, yes. he, that he learned about. Yes. And all he's had negative comments about Christianity in previous letters and everything like that, but he's he has several quotes where he's saying, the Christianity that I despise is this hypocritical, essentially anti-Christ Christianity that I see the slave masters and people uh, propagating, where this this person I hear about in the Bible and the, the non-slave edition of the Bible mm-hmm. uh, is a totally different person. And it's not anything like these mm-hmm. slave masters, these people I've encountered, you know? Yeah, and that's part, you know, that's part of uh, the reason why the efforts to abolish slavery uh, worldwide, not just here in America, but worldwide, uh, was led by Christians. Yeah. Um, it was led by, by those Bible-believing Christ, followers of Christ mm-hmm. who, when they looked at Jesus, they didn't see somebody who mistreated someone or, you know, didn't allow certain opportunities for a person based off their skin color. Mm-hmm. Um and, but they saw someone who valued all people, um, who had compassion toward all people and and uh, and, and cared for all people and, and viewed all people as image bearers of God. Yeah. And so because you are an image bearer of God, I'm sorry, because you are an image bearer of God, uh, regardless of what color you might be in your image bearing, there's a certain level of value uh, and dignity that you're going to carry and that you're going to automatically be afforded because of that. Yeah. Um, and so... Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely speaks to that big time. Um, so let's talk a little bit about today. Okay. Okay. Let's, I, I kind of want to get into that. I mean, we we can stay in the past for a, a little bit longer, but maybe that's part of the problem with today. Ooh, I like it, deal. Come on, go ahead. Go ahead. What we got? Well, for example, when I hear a lot of people talk about race today, there's a few terms that often come up. Mm-hmm. And one of them I think is directly related to what we were just talking about is the word racism. Mm-hmm. And I feel like there's a conflation between the word racism and systemic or systematic racism. Sure. And how that that term is kind of just turned into the word racism. Okay. For example, um, from my understanding, the, the, the historical position on what racism typically means, and correct me if I'm wrong, is prejudging or having prejudice for someone else based on this color of their skin okay and today it's kind of changed where Mm -hmm. more modernly and i think i've noticed this shift more in like the past five to seven years in the popular culture Mm -hmm. where it's someone who is in a position of power socially so like a straight white male for example Mm -hmm. um just them being alive from what i understand and just being around, they are naturally racist, even if they don't intend to be, because the system itself was set up for that individual today. So it's not really judging. It's, it's ironic because it's, it's prejudice. It's because, kind of going down the T, uh, what's it called? CRT, this critical race theory. Yeah, line. yeah. And okay. that, that's like a whole other can of worms because you have like it different is. CRT scholars it's, that it's define a, it a little bit differently. It's a goofy can of worms, but go ahead. Yeah, um, but it's basically that sort of term where racism is not pre uh, the the act of someone prejudging someone based on the color of the skin and how they interact with that person, mm-hmm. but it's ironically prejudging people who are who are white and viewed as in a position of power simply based on them being white. So, for yeah. example, Jalen, you are incapable of being racist under this sort of definition. Oh, yeah, get out of jail free card. I guess so. That's incredible. <laughs> wow. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, so uh, obviously when, when you lay it out like that, it's technically impossible unless you conflate the word racism to mean something different compared to its historical meaning mm-hmm. and what it means today. That's why I love etymology so much. Sure. You know, um, you know what words meant 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. It, it drastically changed all the time. So that act, if you were to prejudge me based on the color of my skin, it wouldn't be considered necessarily racist from the pop culture sort of uh, mindset today mm-hmm. but if, but if you did you did that exact same thing to me it would be considered racist and, and a byproduct of systemic racism because you were essentially programmed to do that right right so i've inherited the system that's changed who i am in that sense i guess so sure and you and you inherited it just by virtue of being white yeah I mean, I guess. I mean, I don't agree with it, (laughs) but (laughs) that's kind of that's kind of the term that I'm seeing a lot. Yeah, yeah. The reason why I I left that pause there because I wanted the viewers to understand how stupid that sounds. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I I hope I hope everybody understood how stupid that sounds. But okay. But I think that Um, pivots into another term that I think is really closely related to the term racism. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'd love to get your opinion on it. The idea of white privilege triggering. Triggering. I'm triggered. The hairs on the back of my neck are standing up. Yeah. So basically, and now they're laying down. People who are, from what I understand, uh, people who are white are privileged just based on the color of their skin. Okay. Because you're white, you have a privilege. Okay. I don't know. I'm sure you're familiar with this term. I mean, but what's your take on that term, that concept, how it's kind of related to systemic racism today? Yeah. So, um, I, I think the term, um, you know, I, I think it's one of those cool trigger terms. That uh, mm-hmm. you know, that get your, that get you going, get the blood pressure up. Um, do I think it has some legitimacy to it? Uh, on a case by case basis, I'm sure you can find it somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, do I think generally in here in 2023, because that's what we're talking about here today, mm-hmm. is that the case? Um, no. Okay. I don't. Um, I think that uh, um you can find a case where everybody's privileged in some way, shape, or form. Sure. Yeah. Um. You know, if if you were to go to Africa um, and hang amongst black Africans, you would find that they probably think us black Americans mm-hmm. are extremely privileged. You have American privilege. See what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So you're taller than me. You have tall privilege, or or, what, or whatever. Yeah. You know. Uh. Uh. And so, uh, do I think that that you? Once again, can I find some individual examples where this is actually legit? Sure. Yeah. But can I slap this blanket on an entire nation mm-hmm. here in 2023? No, I don't think so. And it's weird because I've I've noticed it a lot, especially in these last few years, that like anytime I uh, someone who is white will say an opinion involving race or sure. anything like that. Sure. Uh, and I see it a lot, especially on the internet, because I feel like people have a lot more balls on the internet. Oh, of course. Um, we all do. Th- they'll just slap on LOL, white privilege, or how would you know anything about this topic? Or you don't have a right to have an opinion on this subject, mm. which uh, I-, I find very interesting, because I don't, when I, I think regarding race, we're talking about humans in general. Yes. Not sp- people of the human race. Right. Right. And so, which is which is the true race anyway? Yeah, it's the race I'm a part of at least. Yes. Uh, so, um, yeah, I just find it really interesting that that could just kind of be slapped on and kind of dismissed because, mm-hmm. you know, th- that person is naturally racist, even if they act a certain way, because mm-hmm. the system is set up for them in that way. Sure. Um, so yeah, I just wonder what your thoughts are, and I, I guess you could, from someone's perspective, especially when we talk about all this history and everything. Um, you might be able to make the case, well, look at American history, look at how the, the white man has always been on top and everything. Is, sure. is the system set up for a, a white male individual? What, 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 what I've always wondered is, like, when we say system, what do we mean by that? Um, I've always, I've always wondered like what... Laws and such. Yeah, like, I've, I've always wondered what the word system meant, like, when we talk about the system. Like, is any, I've never heard a person actually define what the system was or who was running it. Mm. Um, well, I guess in a way, I guess we are saying who's running it. We're saying that white people run it, but it's like, okay, which white people? Because, uh, there are uh, just like all black people aren't the same. All white people aren't the same either. Mm -hmm. There are, there are, there are levels within, within the Caucasian ethnicity group as as there are levels within the the black ethnicity group. Like there's a high level or high populace of white homeless men. Sure. They're probably not the ones running the system. Most of the people on welfare are poor whites 
to yes. sound like baby Chappelle, but right. the, the whites. <laughs> right. Um, uh, a, a lot of the welfare is Southern poor white people. Yes. So it's like, it's probably not those guys running mm-hmm. the system. Yeah. So is it the ones who have a high degree of drug abuse? Because when we're talking about heroin and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Some of those harder drugs, crystal meth, heroin. Yeah, those, those uh, us white folk are leading the race in there. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, so it's probably not those guys. Yeah, and so I've I've always kind of wondered, you know, what what that what that was. But um, you know, like I said, you know, can I find individual cases where you can say a person, uh, uh has benefited uh, from a certain situation because they were white? Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, but even here today in twenty twenty three, with all the pandering that's going on politically, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, there there are people who are black who benefited from certain situations because they were black. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I just don't understand the, the, the term and how it gets used when it gets used because it's so subjective, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it, you know, there's no objectivity to this thing. And so it's very, it's, so it's very difficult to say like, you know, I, it's very hard to slap this label on any and everything and just say, that's what it is. Sure. Um, but in, I guess when when we think about um uh the the black community in general, mm-hmm. right? And I, and I hate using that term. Right, uh, cuz it's a collective of very different individuals. It's not like extremely team black, team white. Exactly. So I hate using the term, but I'm mm-hmm. using it because it's it's easily understood. Um when I look at the state of 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 black people today, what I wonder, the question that I come up with is what best defines the state of the black community today. Interesting. Is this is, is is the state of the black community community today a result of systemic racism or is it a result of self-destructive values? Oh. Wow. So so what what I, what I mean by that is um Dill, if you if you'll indulge me for a second. Um I I, I want to my endeavor is to uphold my obligation to the truth okay when we whenever we talk about history as it relates to racism it is often through the lens of uh black people being the victims and the victims only sure and the white uh white man or whomever being the victimizer yeah um and that's it Mm -hmm. however the truth is we don't have or we don't fully color in the history books that was a great pun yeah we we, we don't we don't fully color them in mm-hmm. and what i when what i mean by that um and 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 uh fyi uh i'm probably about to make some black people upset um i don't care uh what i what i you know i'm just letting you know <laughs> uh, yeah I'm, yeah whatever um what what i what i mean by that is if we're being honest, racism is a heart problem. Mm-hmm. Just, it's, it's, sure, it's you know it revolves around skin color, ethnicity, and all that stuff, but it's it's really a a, hum, a condition of the human heart problem. Yeah, we all have one of those. And so, when I when I look at the history books and I see the history books not being filled in with the complete truth especially as it relates to what's being taught in schools, being taught on college campuses and everywhere else, it upsets me because we all claim that we want the truth of the matter. But then when the truth gets told, we, we will, we'll, we'll turn the channel. We'll turn the podcast. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll block you. Right. All of this kind of stuff. Right. But if I'm, if, but if I, if I want to be honest about, racism and some of the things that happened particularly in slavery i got to be honest about the fact that there were black slave masters mm-hmm. I, got, I got to tell the truth about that now i'm not telling the truth about that to uh to diminish what 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 the white slave masters were doing mm-hmm. but i'm telling the truth about it because it's the truth and we got to tell the whole story there were thousands of black slave masters now in other countries or no here in america here in america okay um and and in any other countries as well um if you want to go back to the beginning of the western slave trade 
I, the narrative is that the, the white Europeans came over there and stole us from our land. Mm-hmm. They didn't steal anything. They bought it. Question becomes, who they buy it from? Well, I'll tell you who they bought it from. Stronger tribes in Africa were enslaving weaker tribes. Mm-hmm. The Europeans come over, the, and they already had slavery going in Africa at the time. Right. The Europeans come over wanting to um, um, engage in this slave trade, man, the Arabs as well were, were involved in this slave trade. And so what the stronger tribes in Africa did was they would enslave the weaker tribes, capture them, and leave them in cages along the coast for the Europeans to pick up. You drop off the money, you pick them up. Jeez. That's what would happen. So this idea that, that uh, uh, all black people are innocent in this whole ordeal. It's not true. We were sold into slavery, not stolen into it. Mm-hmm. And, we were, and we were sold into it by people that looked like us. That's the truth of the matter. Get here to America. There were thousands of black slave masters who were black. Some of them owned white slaves. Now, I, I think a lot of us who are, this is brand new knowledge would be pretty perplexed because I until I was friends with you, I didn't know about this. Sure. I was not aware. No one told you, me you, about this. this. They're not talking about this in elementary school, middle school or high school. But this is not the narrative mm-hmm. that we're going to talk about. But once again, this is why I said my obligation is to the truth, because I want to fill in some of those missing mm-hmm. pieces that don't get talked about in the history books. Is there any like. Famous names of some of these black slave masters or anything? I'm so glad you brought that up. Guys like Anthony Johnson. Okay. Look him up. He owned black slaves. William Ellison. Look him up. By the way, uh, the links for all of this will be in the description, the links for everything that I'm saying. So I'm not just talking out the side of my neck. I'm not just spewing some, uh, some, some crazy information that I got from somewhere else. All of the links will be in the description for you guys to check out. Go further than what we did for this episode and look mm-hmm. into this even more. Okay, so I'm just putting that out there. Sure. Uh, but William Ellison, uh, you got names like Andrew Dur- uh, Andrew Durnford, mm-hmm. another black man who owns slaves. You got some black women that own slaves. Oh, wow. Yeah, how's that for a surprise? Yeah. Yeah, black women that own slaves. Names like so- like Sophie Del Hundy. You got names like, uh, Aunt, like, like Antoinette de Bucklet. You got names like Maria Weston, all black women who own slaves. Jeez. I can go into the black women that bought their husbands as slaves and then sold them when they got upset at them. Yes, this type of stuff happened. It's, it's, it's there. It's, this stuff happened. And so I bring this up once again, not trying to diminish what the Europeans did. Right, right. I bring this up to highlight that we have a heart problem, mm-hmm. not a skin color problem, mm-hmm. because those who had the same skin color as some of the African slaves at the opportunity to become what had enslaved them, they took it. Right. So what does that say then? We really have a skin color problem or do we got a heart problem? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, I think the other interesting thing about this is slavery existed before America. Obviously, they're buying slaves in Africa. Yes. But of course, it existed before that as well. Mm-hmm. You know, slavery is one of the oldest practices besides advertisement. Mm-hmm. You might be thinking, where's that? Well, it was in the garden. Oh, this isn't what God said. It's just not even what happened for you. Right. Um, but, you know, slavery was found in all parts of the world. The new thing about America was that. It became about race because Europeans starting a new country in America were the first to ship slaves to another country or one of the first. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the crazy thing about the transatlantic slave trade is most of the slaves did not go to America. Correct. I don't have the exact number. It might be somewhere between like three and 13 Mm percent. But that chunk went to America the rest went to like Central America and South America and mm-hmm. that side of the world. Mm-hmm. That is a lot of people. That's I'm, a ton I'm talking of like over a million people went to a n- whole other countries yes. besides America. Yes. And of course, as Americans, we're going to highlight American history. That makes a lot of sense. 
Um, and I think when we, when we think about slavery in general, we, we focus so much on the, the, the race aspect of it because we're unfortunately kind of superficial people, unfortunately. We, we just look at it that and we're like, that's the only reason it happened was mm -hmm. because their skin was different and they wanted to treat them differently. Though that probably played a big advantage because as humans, we do that all the time. Yes, we do. Jalen, you're a Lakers fan or whatever. Well, you're stupid because obviously the Heat's better. You know, you're just one of those stupid Lakers fans. Or, mm. you know, you like you like that. I'm more of a football guy, so I think guys who like basketball are stupid. You mm. know what I mean? That, that, we can that, find... was, that was racist, and that was an example of your white privilege. Oh, damn it. <laughs> Good night, everybody. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so there, there's so many superficial things we could pick besides the, the pigmentation of your skin mm -hmm. to point a difference at. Sure. Uh, it also kind of reminds me of, I can't remember this teacher's name, but she was like a, a really big influence for me when I was growing up. And she did this experiment in her classroom, and it was called the, the Blue-Eyed Experiment or something along those lines, where she... Um, that, uh, Jane Elliott? Yes. Yeah. Jane Elliott. Yeah, yeah. That's my gal. Yeah, yeah. And she did this experiment in class to teach the kids about racism uh -huh. where she said the, the children with blue eyes were superior to the children with brown eyes. Uh -huh. And we are going to the the blue eyed children are going to get more privileges. They're gonna get like more recess time, sure. extra candy, all that sort of stuff. And they do that for like a day or two. And all the kids with brown eyes felt like crap, of course. And sure. watching their friends play. And I believe after a couple of days, like, all right. Switch places. Mm -hmm. The brown-eyed kids are more favored. Mm -hmm. Brown-eyed kids are better. They they are loved even more and gave them even, like, even more recess time, stuff like that. And that was probably the most real lesson those kids ever learned about arbitrarily treating people based on a superficial characteristic like eye color or skin color and everything. Sure. But we do that all the time. I mean, so, for example, um, I was in – I was getting my finger – getting my fingerprints checked at the government office for like this new job I had. And I was talking to this guy next to me, real nice guy. We were just chatting and everything. He uh, was talking to me about a lot of racism he experienced. This was a guy who lived in the Southern part of Texas. He was Hispanic and he had some family over on the border on Mexico. And he knew a lot of people that would kind of go back and forth or were from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And he said, I experienced a ton of racism. I'm like, what do you mean? Like from white people, he's like, no, the white people were fine. It was the people who grew up in Mexico because they said I wasn't Mexican enough mm. because I grew up in America, even though I spoke great Spanish mm -hmm. uh, and all of that, mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't Mexican enough because I wasn't born in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So they look pretty much the same, mm -hmm. you know, even and they're in the same part of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like his skin was darker. Mm -hmm. It was it was completely a, a cultural difference that he was getting treated poorly for. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like one random dude. It was like several guys from Mexico. Oh, I'm willing to, uh, I mean, I could think of that, you know, with, with black people, black Americans now. I mean, I, you'll hear people say stuff like, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, he black, but he ain't a brother. I've heard uh, that. Yeah, 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 she's black, but she ain't a sister. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, yeah, yeah she black, but you know, you know, she ain't one of us. Yeah, I, I still yeah. don't know what that means. But. Well, I, well, trust me, I, I know what it means. I, I what, 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 it, what it means is what it, what it means is, is what you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. It's just the idea that yeah, sure, you know, you look like one of us, but you ain't, uh, you ain't one of okay. us. Right, you know what I mean? Right. Um, and and it, it's, maybe something like oh, she talks white. Yes, something along those lines. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, she's black, but she grew up in a very nice part of town, so she's black, but she ain't one of us. Mm. You know. Uh, yeah, she she's black, but she you know she educated, so she ain't yeah. one of us. Mm -hmm. uh, that that type of deal. Um, and so I, I want to get back to the the self destructive uh, yeah uh, values and what best explains systemic what best explains the state of the black community now. And the answer, if you would ask me, is self destructive values. Okay. Um, so it's can, to, to clarify, it's not a result of systemic racism that's the black community's problem. It's today. Today. No. It's self destructive values. Absolutely. Like what? Um. Name me a thriving community or a th thriving group of people where 70% of the children are born into single parent homes where the, where the father is absent. Uh, I know the answer, unfortunately. And, and it is the black community in America, unfortunately. No, thriving. Name oh, me a thriving. community that's thriving. Oh, yes. no. That's not a thing. Not a thing. Not oh, a thing. Okay, got it. Um, na name me a community 
where because of the fathers not being in the home and not being married to the mother, the children who are going to grow up and become adults are five times more likely to go to prison, uh, uh, five times more likely not to finish high school or go to college. Um, um, uh, uh, I, I don't remember the exact percentage, but more likely to commit violent crimes, more likely to engage in drug abuse, more likely to engage in some kind of criminal activity at some point in their lives. Um, show me a community that is thriving with those type of statistics. Mm, you can't. I can't. That is the state of the black community mm -hmm. today. We claim, we want to claim that it's about race and skin color and all of that stuff. Um, once upon a time, that was true. It was. Once upon a time, that was absolutely the truth. I'm yeah. not taken away from that whatsoever. But what I find interesting, though, is during that particular time, particularly in the Jim Crow South, the black family was tighter than it had ever been. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that, during that particular time, about 80% of the children were born into married homes, two-parent households. Dad is at home, mom is at home, we are married. It's a giant difference today. It's a giant difference today. And we still had we had the racism going on Jim Crow South. I mean, yeah, we got the racism going on. The, the Klan's yeah. in full effect. You got the, the segregated everything. Mm -hmm. It's in full effect. But 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 the the family structure was was as such that though we were economically uh, challenged in things of that nature in in in, in various different ways, the families were still solid and still able to to function. Now what we have, however, though, is something totally different. And I think that's far more to blame today than any level of racism that you can name mm -hmm. today here in 2023. Um, if a person were to ask me um, how, am, how have I been able to be successful in life and how have I been able to to be prosperous and productive member of society, mm -hmm. I would tell you it has a lot to do with the presence of my father. That's just a stone cold truth. And and this comes from a person who I, I, I lived with my, my mother in the single parent household. I come from that environment. Uh, my parents were extremely young when they had me. Um, and I grew up with, my, it was just us and mom until uh, I was 15 years old and I came out here to live with my dad. Uh, my dad was present in my life throughout that entire time period though. Um, up until I, you know, came to live with him. And then obviously he was very much present. I was living in the house with him. Uh, but I got to tell you from personal experience, there is a difference um, between, you know, living with my mom and going to see my dad and living with my dad. This father absence epidemic that's going on is extremely, extremely damaging. Yeah. And this would ravage any people group. It doesn't matter who it is. Right. You take the fathers out of the home and any people group at a rate of 70 percent. And that people group is screwed. Yeah. Beyond just father absence. Look at the values of the culture. Mm -hmm. We don't value marriage. Um, we barely value childbearing these days. I mean, we black community aborts more kids than anybody. Mm -hmm. um, when. When. When 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 these are the the pinnacles of what we would deem success or what we would deem acceptable behavior, when this is the norm, this community is going to fall apart mm -hmm. and continue to deteriorate, deteriorate, deteriorate until it, until it eventually collapses. I said all that to say that. Again, I'm not diminishing what happened in the past. I think we got to, but I think we got to get away from the past now. Kind of like how you brought up before, like perhaps part of the issue is we're trying to see everything through a past lens. Yeah, and it's time to get away from that. That's not that's not our lane anymore. America, we got more black billionaires and millionaires than we've ever had in this country ever. Yeah, ever. There's been tremendous progress. 
mm-hmm. with 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 some regress as mm-hmm. a, in in certain individual pockets. But overall landscape, yeah, there's been tremendous progress in the in the in the Department of Race Relations, mm-hmm. and I think it's been so much so to the point where we can we that at some point or another here we got to stop looking backwards and pointing at that to move forward toward a more productive uh, relationship amongst ourselves yeah. in terms of blacks and whites in this country, but also for the forward progression of, of black people in this country or mm-hmm. the black community, quote unquote, as a whole. That's no longer our problem anymore. Right. It's just flat out not. The nuclear family is our problem. In case we haven't noticed, I'll say this really quick. The nuclear family is the foundation of any society on the face of this planet. Absolutely. Um, it, is, it is the nuclear family that builds communities, communities that build towns, towns that build that turn into cities, cities that turn into states, states that turn into nations. All of that rests on the foundation of the nuclear family. Mm-hmm. So the family goes. So any people group goes. Right. Any people group. You can name them. If that nuclear family is not intact, everything else is going to fall apart. I don't care what anybody says. And even historically speaking, the nuclear family concept is kind of a modern invention, is that being the focal point. Because, like, especially if you think of, like, Jewish cultures back then, it wasn't an emphasis on mom, dad, and a couple kids. It was an emphasis on, like, the whole using tribe for better terms, like the whole pack of the family. Sure. Because if, if your dad dies, your mom dies, you have four grandparents, a bunch of cousins, and this giant family that sure. are all living either together or within a same area working together. Mm-hmm. So if someone's slacking, I got 25 other family members that are picking up. And so I think I think that's another thing that I think we should really think about too, is really strengthening the overall f- emphasis on the nuclear family, of course, but like having that that support group all around them as well with other the extended family as we call it now mm-hmm. so i just think it's interesting that like that that's like a big concept in like a judaic culture and stuff like that indian culture especially yeah absolutely yeah, absolutely and i and i guess i, I guess I, I say nuclear family but i i guess you can say family in general when, yeah. you, when you bring up what, you know what you just brought up um the, that that the structure of the family of, of the family unit is the foundation of any society mm-hmm. and the foundation of any people group if you want to know what's going on in any group of people, look at the families. Yeah. Flat out. That's all you have to do mm-hmm. is look at the families. Yeah. In the black community, if you want to know what's going on with this people group, look at the families. Where are the men? Mm-hmm. It'll tell you everything else that's going on. Right. I know we don't want to hear that. Right. Black women in particular probably not probably not going to hear that. I don't, and it's and, and, definitely and, and not. Let, let, let me let me separate from you. I don't care. I'm, I'm once again. My obligation is to the truth. Sure. Well, what I was going to say is a caveat with that. It's not as if mothers or even black mothers are incapable of being sufficient parents. We're not saying that. Definitely not the point. The point is, a lot of men have failed to live up to the responsibility yes. of fatherhood. Yes. There's a lot of abandoning fathers. Yeah. And it's not even exclusively a black thing, but it's, it's really a not. giant epidemic in the, the black community yeah, in general. It's, yes, it's, it's more, um, it's, a, it's a bigger issue in the black community, mm-hmm. uh, maybe than other, and other ethnicities, right? Not particularly here in America, but back but to the point you just brought up, we're not saying that uh, black women or black mothers in general are, are not good parents. What we, what we are saying though is that the 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 parent dynamic that God set up in the first place was mm-hmm. not meant to be gone gone through alone. Right, right. It was never set up that way. Yeah, it was not. It, the it was never set up for any one of us to be enough. Right, right. Whether that be the single mom or the single dad, it wasn't. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was never set up to where I would be sufficient for my daughter or or my wife would be sufficient for my daughter. And that's all she needs. Right. No, it was set up as such. No, she needs both of you guys. Right. And and the best version of her is that is, is her standing on the foundation of me and her mother being married in a low conflict setting. Exactly. Children thrive in those settings. Yeah. The, the statistics are embarrassing. When you put a child into a two parent household, mom and dad are married in a low conflict setting. They are smarter. They make more money. They are more emotionally stable. They, uh, uh, they, 
they they achieve in just all areas. Their interpersonal relationships they, are typically yeah. healthier because they have better examples growing up. Exactly. Because and actually, when you think about the high causality, and this isn't even just a black community thing, but the high causality of abuse, uh, people who are abusers and and uh, people who propitiate domestic violence. If you figure out what happened in their house, typically their fathers or someone close to their family was also doing that stuff. Sure. So they either experienced it themselves or witnessed it enough that it was it seemed like normal behavior. Same thing with uh, child pre- uh, people who are sex offenders. Mm-hmm. Typically, they experienced it themselves or had someone close to them that went through that as well. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like some new idea that they got. Mm-hmm. Of course, mental illness plays a big factor, but your environment is really going to point you towards different behavioral standards. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So we've talked about the past. Um, we've talked about a little bit about what's going on now. Um, oh, something else I want to bring up with the past, especially with those black slave masters, mm-hmm. um, to continue coloring in accurate history. There were a, a, a very nice chunk of black slave masters who would free their slaves relatively easily after mm-hmm. after purchasing them um i don't want to leave them out um but but then there was also a handful who were commercial slave traders and did it for profit so i want i want to make i just want to make sure i colored that in mm-hmm. um, i don't want to leave that out um maybe we talked about the past and what's happened we've talked about some of what's what's going on today um in race relations um and what's happening um i guess what i wonder is it seems like we had a problem then and it seems like we still got one now. Probably have one in the future. Probably have one in the future. Mm-hmm. Is there a solution to this heart problem? No. <laughs> All hope is lost. I've decided just right now that this is a nihilist podcast. I will let you go ahead and wrap this up. Go ahead. Good night, folks. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. <laughs> So, <laughs> Obviously, the pointed answer is the gospel. Absolutely. The, the answer is, is Christ, the lessons he gave us, and the way he has pushed us to remind us who we are. Mm-hmm. I think having our identity to be rooted not in the color of our skin, not in our preferences, not in cultural standards, but the fact that we are made in the image of God and that all human beings share that sort of relationship with one another and with God himself above us. Mm-hmm. And I think that is where the emphasis needs to be when, whenever we're thinking about race relations in general. Agreed. Um, and so spe- speaking of the gospel, um, our, 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 good, our dear friend and good buddy, Jesus, hey. um, he dealt with racism um, in, in, his, in his time yeah. on earth. Uh, believe it or not, racism is actually nothing new. And there is racism in the Bible. Absolutely there Whoa. is. Um, shocking, this right? This book's got everything. I mean, believe it or not, strange how this all works out. But uh, Jesus actually dealt with racism um, in, 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 his, in his own way. Um, I want to pull up uh, Luke chapter 9. Okay. Um, and it's, I think it's around verse 51 um, where uh, Jesus, yeah, it's around verse 51, Luke chapter 9, um, where Jesus um sets his face to go to Jerusalem, right? And uh he sent some messages he sent some messengers ahead of him who went into a village of uh Samaritans, it was a people group called Samaritans, and he sent them ahead of him to make preparations for him. Mm-hmm. And the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. Oh. Okay. And so what was interesting is this people group, they, the Bible doesn't necessarily go into the details about why this people group didn't receive him. All they said was sure. the Samar- he went to go into a Samaritan village, want to pass through there to get to Jerusalem. They found out that he wanted to go to Jerusalem and said, you can't come through here. Mm-hmm. The question becomes, well, we know Jesus was a Jew, but how come this Samaritan group of people did not want him to pass through their town? Yeah. Well, you want, you want to talk about the, the race relations between hit me. You, you want me to talk about it? I'll talk about it. Got it. Sure. So for background context, um, the Jews and the Samaritans um, uh, were a a people group that had a whole lot of racial tension against each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 
going way, way back, kind of like how we did here in America, yeah. going way, way back, uh, back when Solomon uh, was king of, uh, of, of Israel, uh, after, his, after his kingship, when he passed away, we know the kingdom of Israel got split into two kingdoms. There was a northern part and a southern part. Um, well, the northern part ended up getting invaded by a group of people called the Assyrians. And the Assyrians came in, conquered the, the northern kingdom of Israel. And what they did was they left a remnant of people there and they sent Assyrians into this remnant to essentially take them over, um, um, repopulate the region with them. And, uh, and they created this mixed people that we call Samaritans. So Samaritans were mixed, were, were Jews and Assyrians mixed together. So mixed breeds of people, right? The, uh, the purebred Jews of the southern kingdom, if you will, didn't like these people. Right. Because they were mixed. And not, mm-hmm. only, were, not only were they mixed, um, they also worshipped different gods and things like that. They had a totally different culture, totally different everything. But it was essentially what it created was this race war between the Jews and the Samaritans. Well, that was back when Solomon was king. And now here Jesus is some, geez, I don't know how, I don't know how many years were between Solomon and Jesus. Probably at least five to eight hundred, somewhere around there. Yeah, it's a pretty long time. But five, whatever it is, five to eight hundred years later, Jesus is dealing with the race relations or the racial tensions that were created back in the time of Solomon. So that's where it comes from. When we read this passage in Luke chapter nine, Jesus is trying to go through this Samaritan, this Samaritan village. And they said, you can't come here because you're heading to Jerusalem. Why? Because we don't want your kind coming through our part of town. Wow. So Jesus dealt with racism. Yeah. Um, and what's what's interesting uh, about that is, well, actually following this, 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 this particular episode, uh, when his disciples James and John saw the treatment, saw they saw how they were obviously being racist toward Jesus. Uh, their response was, "Lord, do you want us to uh, call down fire from heaven and consume them?" Right? Want us to kick that? Right. <laughs> this commercial is bought to you by, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they they that's essentially what they were looking to do, right? They're like, oh, "Okay, you want to be racist toward us? We're gonna." You know, we'll hurt you for it. Mm-hmm. But Jesus actually ends up rebuking them for that question that they asked. Right, yeah. And they just turned and went to another village. That is a very interesting response from Jesus. It's pretty shocking. Pretty shocking. Yeah. That, in, that in the face of racism, you rebuke the ones who wanted to retaliate to the racism, mm-hmm. but not the ones who were racist. Yeah, and I, I think, especially if if we had woke intersectionality Jesus today. Totally got <laughs> Uh, the, the the Jesus not of the Bible, but the uh, the God made in our in in the image of ourselves. Thank, thank you for that distinction. Yes, um, if we had that, it would be really easy to be like, sure, let's cast some fire on them right away. They're obviously wrong. Sure, but I, I think there's a deeper lesson behind that between taking sort of this this posture of peace, this sort of position of of grace for these people, mm-hmm. understanding they know not what they do, what they're doing, and. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just so interesting that he rebuked the person who is trying to retaliate. And it kind of reminds me of the scripture verse uh, that we're not supposed to seek. I'm kind of paraphrasing. We're not supposed to seek vengeance because uh, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Yep, I will it's really you. interesting because if you think about it, you know, let, let's say, you know, I kill your donkey. Well, you're going to kill like two of my donkeys because you, you don't want to just get me back, but you want to get vengeance. Right. Well, I'm going to kill four of your donkeys. Well, you're going to burn down my house. Well, I'm going to kill your wife and burn down your village. And then we're just going to keep blowing up and blowing up and blowing up. So from mm-hmm. a practical standpoint and a, a social standpoint, it makes perfect sense that Jesus say, okay, we're not going to do that because mm-hmm. it's not the right move. And in general, we're not going to fight fire with fire. We're not going to fight hate with hate. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're being racist. Okay, they're being dumb. Mm-hmm. Cool. We don't have to go down to their level and and hit them right back with that we Mm -hmm. can instead take a position above them and try to give them grace instead Mm -hmm. you know if someone's going to be rude to me in any situation especially with racism in general um you know i don't have to say a racial slur back don't have to you know i could i could understand their ignorance and and instead pray for their Mm well-being and pray that god reveals themselves to them Mm -hmm. Uh, reveals himself to them and that they they change their heart they change their mind and mm. repent 
Yeah. So that's a better position to take than well. I'm just going to kill you. Yeah, and it's and it's wrong. Also, yeah, right. And it is, but it is also you know, it's, it's one thing to say that uh, the hypothetically and theoretically, it's another thing to actually do it. It's very difficult to. That's do. why I talk about it on the podcast and not do it. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so much easier to that's chat why, about. That's it. That's why I tell other people to do it, but I don't. Um, <laughs> but but yeah. So it, it's a uh, yeah. This ain't easy, man. No, not not at all. Oh. Particularly in the in these types of situations, like. Like Jesus experience. That's part of the reason why I like Jesus so much is because there are too many experiences that we've had that he hasn't. Right. Yeah. And so um, he's relatable to anyone. He, he's yeah. not the whitewashed Jesus we see in random pictures. Yeah, that's not even which, which is ironic because you see the most of those in black Baptist churches. That's very true, actually, which is really interesting. Which is so very the true. sort of whitewashed Jesus. You see him the most in black churches. So, I mean, like what? Yeah. But he, he probably wasn't white. I mean, he's no, from he the he freaking G- ancient Near East. He I mean, a, he was a Jew. He's a little he probably a little brown. Yeah, a little he was, bit. Yeah, he was a Jew. I, he wasn't Caucasian or European by any stretch. He was right. a Jew. And even so, it's just, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't. But nevertheless, it that's just not. I know we cause because of the conversation. Was Jesus white? Jesus black? Oh yeah, bronze skin. He looked like us. Right. Okay. I actually what, talked what to a mean? guy on Facebook one time. He was from Africa, and he's like, "Of course you worship Jesus. He looks just like you." And at the time, I had long hair, and I was just like giggling. I'm like, "Dude, Jesus probably wasn't white." No. Even so, what a dumb reason to not like give Christianity a chance. Oh, their God's white. It's like really. That's how, that's the. That's the length of thought. That's the depth of thought you've had on this topic is like, well, mm-hmm. I'm not going to worship a white God. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, if I filled in the color a little bit, would that make you feel a little better? Is that is that the, the surface level uh, thinking that we have about relating to other people is they understand who I am if they're, the pigmentation in their skin is similar? Wow. And, and, and that's interesting because we've had, you've told me recently, like, Dylan, I relate to you more than some black people. Yes. Like you and I have had so many similar experiences up growing. Like we've we've yes. both been in Section Eight. Yes. We've both been on food stamps. Yes. We've both have been in just low income and and, and dysfunctional homes. Dysfunctional homes mm-hmm. and witnessing abuse and things like that. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, and it didn't have something necessarily to do with the color of our skin. We mm-hmm. just had similar circumstances and we think similarly mm-hmm. about a lot of things. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. Um so I, I just find that so funny, uh, when people think that surface level, like, oh well, you know, he's not black, so he's not going to get it. Well, speaking of that, so once again, our our, our good dear friend Jesus. Oh, hey. uh, so in the hey, very, yeah, in the very next chapter, uh, Luke chapter ten, um, he he, he gives this this parable that I, that I that I want to talk about, and it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, 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 now Jesus was it's a interesting. He's he using the Samaritan who is just being racist. Mm-hmm. In the previous chapter, mm-hmm. I didn't catch that before. And not only is he using the Samaritan who was racist, he's talking to a Jew about the Good Samaritan. That is such an ironic slap in the face, like turn of events. Spin my whole, spin your so, whole current worldview we, on your head. We, we got to read it. We got to read it. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna read it. And behold, uh, this is uh, chapter ten, verses twenty-five through thirty-seven. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. To put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Mm-hmm. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Kind of, that's an interesting question. Ooh. So Jesus replied, Ooh. So Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan. That racist Samaritan, Mm -hmm. as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Mm hmm. Interesting that racist Samaritan was capable of compassion. Wow. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on, pouring on oil and wine, and then sent him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when you come or when I come back. 
Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Here's what I find interesting about this parable, right? Because I, I, I've, I've been digging into this thing for like two weeks. One, I find it interesting that he decided to tell this parable to a Jew. Mm -hmm. Especially last chapter. Just last chapter. Uh-huh. Um, but also what I find interesting about it is he used in the in this parable, he used two people that the lawyer could relate to. And and not only could could he could he relate could he relate to them, he he used them in such a way to show that your idea of 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 this surface level thinking of, of, of skin color and ethnicity ultimately has nothing to do with what really matters. Mm -hmm. Because the two people that look like you in this parable were the most trifling of people in the whole parable. Right. Yeah. The priest, Jewish priest, saw him, saw him beat down and passed by the other side. You just cross the street. Mm -hmm. So you you saw this man on the side of the road, beat up, half dead. Mm -hmm. And you just walked on the other side of the street and carried on about your day. And then the Levite walks up. And does the exact same thing. We got the same skin color. We look alike. Right. What does that say about same your culture? Care? Same yeah, same religion. culture. Yeah, all that. All that. And, and, and uh, the, the cherry on top of all that, the priest would have been, from a social status and religious standpoint, a very, very high authority. Yes. Would have considered extremely pious because he's the one giving the temple sacrifices. Yes. For the, the church at the time. So surely and you'll then, do the right thing. Right. And then the Levites were the tribes that were primarily supporting the priesthood. Mm -hmm. So we could argue that that was the most pious part of Israel. Sure. The, the, the top and the second part mm -hmm. of all of that. Mm -hmm. And so... He's he's doing a representation. He's like, okay, you understand the law. Let me show you two people who definitely understand intellectually the law. Mm -hmm. I understand intellectually that I'm supposed to love the Lord my God with all my heart and soul and strength. Mm -hmm. I also understand intellectually that I'm supposed to love my neighbor. Yeah. But then we show two people who know the law like the back of their hand, and they clearly haven't put it in their heart, and they're not implementing it mm -hmm. because they're not helping their neighbor. Sure. And then comes along this Samaritan. Mm -hmm. who don't look like me, you know, you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a black man first and the Samaritan guy don't look like me. He doesn't look like the, he doesn't, he doesn't look like the man who's beat up on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so, so we ain't got that relation going on. Right. Right. And yet he, and yet, and yet Christ lets it be known that he saw him and had compassion. That, that's a, character trait that that's that that speaks to the integrity of one's character and actually something that you have control over right you don't have control over whether or not you white or black or indian or it right. just is what it is but when he got to the samaritan he he made christ made sure to highlight that this guy chose to exercise that which he had control over in a different way than the other two did the other mm -hmm. two who looked like you mr lawyer Right. So think about that. So think about that. Think about this idea that because you're a certain skin color, you're going to conduct yourself a certain way. Mm -hmm. And how that falls on his face when we, when we actually put it to the test. Mm -hmm. But I do find the lawyer's answer also interesting as well. Because after the Samaritan guy, he, he goes to him, binds up his wounds. I mean, I mean so, so he stops his whole day to take care of this this uh this Jew that's on the side of the road, this man that's on the side of the road. Binds up his wounds, puts him on his animal, takes him to an inn, which is essentially like a hotel, something like that. Um and took care of him while he was there. The next day he took out, he he goes to his account, takes out money and pays it to the innkeeper and says, "Take care of him while he's here. Make sure he's okay. Get him back on his feet." Whatever you spend outside of this money that I've given you, I'll come back and pay you back. Wow. You see the level of compassion there? Right. Remember, this guy don't look like me. Mm -hmm. 
This, 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 you know, we he 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 ain't a brother. He ain't a sister. Mm-hmm. Any of that goofiness we got going on. Mm-hmm. But he had compassion on this guy. But look at look at the character. Right. Look at that which he had control over. Look at the integrity, the the compassion, the integrity, the 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 gentleness, the mercy that he had on him. Because I mean, he, he could have very well just repeated what the other guys did. I mean, the people that looked like him walked walked right on by him. How come I can't? Right. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't do that. And then I find the lawyer's uh, answer to Jesus question interesting, too, because the lawyer says, uh, Jesus said, you know, w- which one of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who had fell among the robbers? Mm-hmm. And the lawyer says the one who showed him mercy. I noticed that he didn't say the Samaritan. He was, I bet he was kind of like. Yeah, like kind of biting his tongue. A yeah, because 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 remember at the the beginning of this exchange, uh-huh. he he asked his question of who is my neighbor, seeking to justify himself. Uh huh. And so his and so his answer to his own question. Yeah, I'm willing to bet he had a hard time saying out loud. Yeah, he couldn't say Samaritan. Yeah, because we don't look alike. Yeah, but that's but that's the. That's the beauty of the gospel, though, right? Is that it it, it transcends mm-hmm. the surface level stuff. Yeah. Um, I got I got a personal story that I that I that I want to share about uh the gospel and transcending the personal stuff, if you don't mind. Sure. So um this had to be, geez, four years ago. Yeah, about four years ago, before COVID. I'm at a gas station. I'm actually on my way up here uh, mm-hmm. for our band rehearsal. And um I'm at a gas station. I'm pumping gas, and um, I'm about to take my own medicine here in this story. Okay, this idea of focusing on the the trivial and focusing on what transcends the trivial. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm at a gas station pumping gas, and uh, I finish up putting the pump back in, getting ready to get in my car. And as I'm putting the the pump back into the nozzle, I hear this woman's voice, and she goes, "Young man, excuse me, young man." I turn Very around. Good Asian. Well, I I turn around and it's a this elderly Chinese woman. Mm -hmm. She had to be, geez, I say at least seventy plus. Okay. I mean she, I mean she was like four foot nothing. I mean that woman had to be seventy plus. And uh, she goes, "Excuse me, young man." I I turn around. I say, "Yes." And she goes, "Will you teach me to pump gas?" I'm like, "What?" It's a weird question to hear in the middle of the day. Well, not even just that. It's a weird question to hear from somebody who drove a car to a gas station. <laughs> and so I'm like, and so I'm sitting here like, what in the teach you to pump gas? I'm thinking I'm like, this got to be a setup. Like, what are we doing? And she goes, um, yeah, I, she goes, I'm really scared and I'm driving my son's car and I don't know how to pump gas and I'm low on gas. And I was wondering if you can teach me. Can you help me? So I say, oh, this is weird, but OK, fine. I'm going to help you. Lady gets excited. Oh, mm-hmm. thank you so much. Thank you so much. I go get money. She goes to her car, pulls out her her, her credit card, Dylan. And as I say, this is a four foot nothing elderly Chinese mm-hmm. woman. I'm a six foot plus, 200 plus pound black guy. Okay. Looks great. <laughs> yeah. Op- optically, right? This, right? This, what can go wrong? Right. Dylan, this woman comes up to me and just gives me her credit card. Gives it to me. No nothing just gives it to me here you go and just sitting there looking at me like what next and i'm sitting there looking at this one with this card in my hand like oh my god like what are we doing so I, i'm like okay I'm, I'm thinking in my head like lord i'm, I'm about to go to jail like this, this can't be it I, right i'm about to go That's to jail I go. yeah and so I, I so i take her inside i'm like okay i look at her car she was driving a small little four-door Saw a small little car. At the, at the time, twenty bucks would have probably flipped, filled her tank. Remember that when twenty bucks would actually do something for a gas tank. But anyway, oh, the days. Right. Um. So I um. So I I, I take her inside, and um. Uh. We, we're walking, and she she walking right next to me, and we get in line, and I'm just standing there with this woman's card in my hand, and I and I give it back to him like, okay, here, you 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 take your car for now, okay? You you take the car because I'm like this this got to be a setup. I'm going to jail, so I'm like, you you take the card. And she's like, oh, okay, okay, no problem. And she just sit there, hold it. 
And uh, we get up to the front. I say, you know, we're going to tell them we want $20 on a pump. I don't remember what pump she was on, but I told her, you know, we, we're going to tell them that. You're going to put in your card information, and then we'll go back out, and we'll f- I'll show you how to fill up uh, the, the gas tank. And she's, okay, okay, thank you so much, young man. Thank you for your help. Okay, no problem. So we get up to the front. I, we tell them what pump and all that, 20 bucks on whatever. We get out to the pump. I show her how to take the nozzle out, which graded glass to select. Put it, put the nozzle in, and we're waiting for it to fill up. And this had to be the longest twenty dollar pump I'd ever been a part of. But in that time from when it started to when it finished, mm-hmm. this woman hugged me in excess of seven or eight times. And she's hugging me and saying, "Thank you so much for helping me, young man." I was so scared. I didn't know what I was going to do because my son's garbage man got a gas and I was trying to get back to him. I don't really know where I'm going very well. And I was scared. But thank you so much for helping me. She keeps thanking me, thanking me, thanking me and keeps keeps on hugging me. I am so uncomfortable at this point. I'm just like, OK, OK. I'm looking at the pump like, hurry up. Let's get this thing over with. And then what changed the experience for me, though, was um, she began to ask me a series, series of questions. Um, she asked me, uh, she said, uh, she said, young man, uh, your, your parents do a good job with you. I said, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I'll be sure to tell them. Uh, and she goes, okay. Uh, she's, where are you going? Oh, I'm, I'm going to, um, play the drums. I said, I'm going to band rehearsal with my band and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, and then she looked at me one final time and after giving me one more hug, she starts crying. And that's really when I'm like, oh, my goodness, because she because because of how it looks. Here I am, this black guy. You made an old lady cry at the gas station. This old Chinese lady crying at this gas station. And she is and she I mean, like tears are streaming. She's crying. And she's like, because I was so scared and I didn't know what I was going to do. And you helped me. I really appreciate that. And I said, no problem. No problem. I'm looking at the pump. It's still a night twenty dollars yet. And I'm just like, oh, my God. Um. But then she asked me one final question, though. And she said, young man, you Christian, aren't you? And I looked at her and I was like, yeah, I am. But why would you ask me that? She said, I know. I can tell. And I'm like, all righty then. But... That changed the experience for me, though. The reason why I changed the experience for me is because here I am focused on the trivial matters of the fact that I'm a black man helping this elderly Chinese woman in what appears to be a very suspicious situation. That same situation that I viewed as suspicious, she views that it's an experience with God answering her prayers. And it got me to thinking, Dill. How many experiences have been missed out on by not only me, but people in general because of focusing on trivial matters like skin color? Mm -hmm. Here this woman is crying. I mean, joyfully crying because God has answered her prayer. She was in a situation where she was scared to know what she was going to do. And God answered her prayers in real time. Right. And here I am looking at the pump, waiting for this experience to be over with. Because I'm focused on the trivial matters. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'm a black man first. Not a, you know, not, you know, that's how most people are. I'm a black person first. I'm a white person first. I'm white this. I'm black that. I'm Indian this. I'm a a Vietnamese that. But, But the question that she asked me really stuck with me that you Christian, aren't you? Because it, it, it beat me over the head later on, because if the answer to that question is yes, how come I didn't see God in that experience until it was over with? Mm-hmm. Why wasn't I rejoicing with her in the fact that God had answered her prayers? I can tell you why I wasn't. Because I was focused on what doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. I was focused on the uncontrollables. I was, fo- I was focused on the, 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 the trivial of, of skin color. I'm a black man first, so I can't help this Chinese woman. I can't be the answer to this Chinese lady's prayers because I'm a black man. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, she's crying tears of joy because I don't care. God, I don't care what the answer looks like. I just want an answer. And it better be yes, please. <laughs> and she don't care. She didn't care about the fact that I was black. She was just happy that I was going to answer her prayer. Right. I wonder what would happen to relations between 
the 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 Caucasian community and the black community quotes here in America. If we decided to stop caring about what it looked like, mm-hmm. we 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 decided to let go of the optics, right, and let God do what He does. Mm-hmm. Another experience that I had with this was with you. Mm. If I would have focused on the optics, I would have missed an experience with God again. Mm-hmm. How would this podcast come to be? Right. How how would I have had a, a front row seat to Christ transforming your life over the past three to four years now? If I focused on the optics of, you know, I'm a, I'm a black man first. So, I, I, yeah, God, the podcast is a really great idea. Yeah, di- I like Dylan, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a black man first. You idiot. Seriously. It's that it's idiotic, mm-hmm. and I and I I would have missed God in this whole thing because I'm worried about the stuff that don't matter. Right. This Samaritan village in Luke chapter nine missed an experience with God. Yeah. Big time. Live and direct. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> because they were focused on the optics mm-hmm. and what doesn't matter. I wonder if the the improvement of the racial tension, the ending of racism is somehow wrapped up in an experience with God where trivial matters like race and skin color don't matter. Mm-hmm. Just my thoughts. We don't know what else to say beyond that. If you like our podcast, you should like and subscribe for more not controversial content at all. Pretty much, if you're okay with that. No. But until next time, appreciate you guys watching, and thanks for the, the, the likes and the subscribes and all that good stuff. We recently hit 1,000 followers on Facebook. We did. We're like uh, pretty dope. like 1,400 and something followers on really? all of our platforms. Yeah. Oh, like total? Yeah, yeah. Between, oh, uh, fa- okay. yeah, between like Facebook and YouTube TikTok. and TikTok. That's pretty cool. But until next time, let's keep growing that uh, – that 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 platform just keep growing those numbers. Can we get to two thousand by twenty twenty four. You decide. Yes, you do. But until next time, I am your co-host Jalen Thompson, Dylan Schweitzer, and as always. Boy,